definitely agree with you. But uh, one of my passion in terms of building robots for India is to combine uh, multiple technologies. And when you actually, instead of taking one robot at a time, if you actually consider family of robots, you do different words. Like you use drone in a non sexy way and yeah. you use robot and all that stuff. Then you can actually do this last mile delivery problem and it's all about whether to take water delivery. Yes. Um, go to the more regions of, of northern part of yeah. India um, without mentioning that of the real estate. A lot of hard work is done by them yes. uh, in terms of taking water yeah. and you know they, they don't they do not like to meet because of certain practices with another way. Yes. Google is genderless so and it can deliver. Absolutely. You can actually you know solve a lot of cycle time issues in terms of where the doctor is yes. and when the doctor will arrive, how the payment happens. In, in cities in, yeah. in terms of healthcare, yeah. I and mean, you can utilize that around this, those resources that you save into something where uh, which are much more human, where much more human contact is there. And Absolutely. Obviously. So there are multiple use cases. And now, since you mentioned that, and since you mentioned about your passion about research, we'll talk about two things yeah. family of robots, and we'll get into this issue which most people talk about, but most don't have any idea of what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Is family of robots. Mm -hmm. One is very simple, which I mentioned, which I call as industrialization. That means machines, different kinds of machines are working together on a particular data set, solving a particular problem. Yeah. Whether you call them robots or whether you call them machines which yeah. can walk, fly, yeah. uh, do things, is the second thing. There are several examples of that. A lot of people talk about AI, and the moment you mix AI with robots, they say hey, robots are going to create their own families, mm -hmm. they are going to take over the world, mm -hmm. or they are much lesser sort of data that will become intelligent, mm -hmm. and that intelligence will make robots far more superior, and their mistakes cannot be covered mm -hmm. per se. So, what is as yeah. person who is doing research and who has this kind of a view of future, mm -hmm. what do you see? How much truth is there in these kind of talks, yeah, yeah. and what what actually research is happening in this area? Yeah, absolutely, I think what you're referring to is this whole concept of singularity, and, and people sort of all the way from not not just anybody, but people like Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking, and people very reputed people talking about the dangers of AI and robotics if you don't careful. And so I think there is, without doing any kind of fear mongering, I think. There is some truth to the core nature of their worries in terms, but that is not in terms of the robots are going to take over and you know be the Terminator kind of scenario. But it's a different, it's a completely different thing. So, so one way of being in that Terminator kind of scenario. I don't. I personally don't. I mean, I keep joking to my guys in the lab that. Oh, if a robot chases you, just walk up three stairs, a flight of stairs or steps, and it won't be because with current technologies, climbing steps for a biped robot is pretty much impossible. So in a way, I think there is a populistic, journalistic view of things. And then as you pointed out, people who work on the research understand the integrity of it. So the dangers come not from the fact that the robots are going to have a mind of their own and take over, but it comes from the complexity that we're building into the system. So, for example, we do a lot of research. You mentioned swarms of robots and IoT of drones and uh, robots talking to each other, solving a problem. So we are actually working on particular problems at the moment. So we have a huge, a large funded project called the Orca Hub in Edinburgh. I think I briefly mentioned that it's about use of drones, underwater vehicles and land and topside vehicles for maintenance of oil and gas rigs. Um, so the point is we want to take people out of harm's way and only have, at the moment, there are about 40, 50 people in the rig. Reduce that to four or five, and everybody else works on an office onshore and monitors everything. And only intervention, which cannot happen in the kind of setting in which we need a human in the loop, that's where they do this kind of supervisory kind of role. So that's already happening. So, in building those systems, what we have found is that scientific research that we do, the added value that we bring to the story is when we use the data that we collect from the robots and then use it to train systems that learns and adapts itself. That's the key word, learning and adapting. So what's different from the traditional way of doing robotics is that earlier, the robots that you talked about in terms of running factories and doing building cars, um, they are pre-programmed to do a particular thing repeated again and again. So that your input-output relationship is very, very clear. But when we have learning systems, adapt adaptive systems, it does improve the quality of the performance of these robotic systems. 
But at the same time, what it does is it adds uncertainty in terms of the behavior of the robots. Mm -hmm. Because when it adapts, we use this notion of value functions. So we have to define using some cost functions, what is good behavior and bad behavior from a robotics perspective. It uses this value function to change and modify behavior. So for example, a simple example, if a robot comes and picks up a load and it tries to move it to a particular place, um, if the load is different from what it's expected, then obviously it will not get to where it wants to be, but it will learn and adapt all the time so that it changes the forces it supplies next time it does. So what's happening under, underneath that is that in response to a particular input, the behavior of the system is constantly adapting and changing to an extent that people can't predict the behavior of those systems. And when you have multiple interconnected systems, it becomes even more complex. So the danger is not that the robots are going to take over and do things. The danger is in the interpretability of the actions of the robotic platforms. When you as a programmer, you program something and, it, and the same thing happens again and again, if something goes wrong, it's easy for you to diagnose and fix. But the moment you've got swarms of systems or learning systems or adaptive systems, diagnosing the causal reasoning of failure becomes much harder. And that's when you kind of get into trouble. So my worry is that we will build complex enough systems with the right intentions of the robots adapting and improving themselves. But when something goes wrong, it, we will be unable to rectify, decipher, understand the causal reasoning. Is it the sensor that failed? Is it the actuator that failed? Is it the logic that failed? Is it the adaptive system that has come up with some loophole that we hadn't thought about that it is exploiting to address a particular cost function. So that's the real danger. And that's why we are now focusing with the DARPA, with, with the, the US government, with the Turing Institute, we are focusing on a whole swath of programs focusing on verifiability and traceability of AI and robotic systems. So the government has sort of mandated that any robotic systems that gets deployed or in public spaces, in hospitals, in airports, in other public spaces, which are not controlled, where humans can come in, they need to have some sort of certification. And this is not the traditional ISO certification of circuits and diagrams and fuses. It's about verifiability of actions. In other words, if something goes wrong, can you trace back the causal reasoning of why that happens? And in learning systems, that is hard. There's new science that needs to be developed to address that. And for me, that is the bigger worry than robots, the Terminator scenario. On that positive note, any message that you have for engineers who are on the verge, computer science engineers who can, or electrical engineers who are on the verge of doing research versus becoming specialists, robotics engineers, or AI developers? Mm -hmm. Okay, the one thing I have to say is that I think there is a role for all kinds of people in today's society. Whether they are coders, whether they are you know, designers, whether they are people who come to conceptualize solutions for a whole global system. So it's about finding your niche, not following the crowd in some sense. So you're a good example of that. I think for your person, I, the reason why I found you really interesting when I was talking to you for a brief amount of time is because, I mean, I think you're somebody who broke the norms in terms of what is a traditional career and sort of really follow your passion. So I think that is important. I think that is hugely important because in terms of driving something, it's not enough if you just do something that's 9 to 5. You need to have the passion for, for doing it. And if you are not suited for a particular kind of thing, it can change. Um, and that, that's, it's no point sort of doing something that you don't care about. I mean, I, I enjoy going to work in my case because I'm, I'm excited about the new kind of things that you do. Of course, you need the support of a huge network of people. So in my current role, I and mean, I do my amount of actual research I do is actually quite minuscule, but I direct a lot of research with the right team around, with the, my PhD students, my postdocs, and they are the ones who keep me young in my sort of thought process. And I think that's what you need. And so for me, it's about being passionate about what you do. From an engineer's perspective, it's about finding the passion. And, and for the Indian government, I would say it's about helping reduce the red tape on all of these things, giving people the freedom to express themselves and reducing red tape. That will really propel the economy and the research here. Passion and freedom. Absolutely. Thank you for this. It's an honor and it's a privilege to do this. I'm, I'm sure 
every engineer and every person who wants to become an engineer or wants to become anything will benefit from that. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.